Good morning. Welcome to Beach Church. Uh, great job to our communications team if you're here. Uh, it was an amazing video. We loved that. It was a lot of fun. So thank you for being a part of that. And thank you for uh, letting us be a part of it, me and my family. Um, if you're joining us here in person in our Jacks Beach campus, or you're on an online campus, welcome to Beach Church. My name is David, I'm the family pastor here, and uh, we're so excited that you're joining us as we begin the second half of our road trip series. Now, if you joined us for the first half, the first few weeks we talked about the book of Jonah, and we kind of worked our way through Jonah and how God um, wanted Jonah to do something and Jonah ran from that, he ran away, and it only took him being eaten by a large fish and then spit onto the shore where God wanted him to go where he decided he would do that thing. But Jonah still eventually was obedient to what God's calling was on his life. And then last week, Pastor Emmanuel kind of stepped in and did sort of a mid intermissionary um, message between the two books of the Bible where he talked about um, what it looked like, the vision for our discipleship trips and what it looks like to go in those places. And he brought up a great point where he said the importance of humility, um, he talked about the importance of the humility in our ministry and the importance of being obedient in all that we do regardless of our success by the world standards. And in a lot of ways, this is a great sort of transition into the book of James and talking about humility. Um, and that's where we're going to have the second half of our road trip series land is on the book of James. But before we get started, let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for people who are here today and online who are listening to your word. We pray for hearts of humility, we pray for hearts of openness to what you wanna do in their lives. And we pray for transformation in a powerful way. Amen. How many of you in this room have brothers and sisters? Siblings. Great. Of those of you that have a brother and sister or sister, how many of you are the favorite? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> how many of you know clearly who the favorite is, but it is not you? Same. So uh, I have one sibling. I have a sister. She's a few years older than me. Her name is Angela. And uh, Angela was the favorite. She still is. Maybe. I don't know. We have kids and she doesn't. So maybe that like gives us a little bit of a push. I think my parents like Morgan, my wife, more than they like me. But anyway, my sister, my sister was the first female born in our family. Uh, my aunt was about 17 years older than my mom. And so by the time she had four sons, she tried to have a girl and just didn't. So she had four sons. And then by the time my sister came around, everybody had been waiting a long time for a girl to enter the family. And so when she came into the family, everybody was super excited. And that was the thing that made her special. That was the thing that made her unique. That was the thing that made her different. And ultimately, probably the thing that made her the favorite. Um, I texted her yesterday and I said, hey, I'm talking about this. Is it okay? Actually, I didn't even ask her if it was okay. I just said, I'm talking about this. Um, you're the favorite, but I need like a tangible example. And instead of saying, of course I'm not the favorite. Mom and dad doesn't, they don't have favorites. She goes, hold on a second. I think it was just, I mean, primarily because I'm a girl, but yeah, I'll give you something. So she knows, she knows she was the favorite. She didn't even argue with me. She just said, yes, I'm the, I'm the favorite. Here we go. So I said, think about it, text me back, let me know. So last night later, she sent me a message saying, um, the reasons why, colon, and then it said, hand and foot plate. And at first I was like, what is she talking about? And then uh, in, for, in pictures, and I go, okay, hand and foot plate. Oh, so when they were little kids, you know how you can make plates, like commemorative plates of your kids with their hands and their feet? Um, my parents did that for my sister, but they did not do that for me. So there's an example, tangible example of she was the favorite. She has hand and feet plates. I do not. Um, the second example that she gave was pictures. In our house, between our dining room slash kitchen area, going to the back of our house in the bedrooms, there was a big hallway. And in the hallway, there were three rows of pictures, and it was just of us, it was just of kids. Um, and I'll give you a guess how many rows I got. One of the three, and my row was smaller than the other two. So therefore, tangible examples and reasons why my sister was the favorite, twice as many pictures as I had, and then also she got a hand and foot plate and I didn't. Now, all of that has nothing to do with the book of James, other than the fact that who James is, and when you think about the book of James, uh, it is widely believed that James 
is the half-brother of Jesus. So imagine in that moment trying to be the favorite in that household and or sharing a bathroom with the Son of God. And that is where we land today uh, in the book of James. It's estimated the book of James was written between the uh, years 40 and 50 A.D., sometime before his martyrdom, which was 62 or 63 A.D. Um, In addition to being the brother of uh, Jesus, James was also known as one of the pillars of the Christian church. And as many scholars point out, he kind of beautifully walks the line between Jewish tradition and Christian life and where both groups of people respected and revered him. And it is written that Christians who converted to Ju- from Judaism, um, that's what this book is written to, Christians who converted from Judaism, and providing them ways in which they live, should live a Christian life. And there are many parallels, I was talking to Pastor Jerry this morning, between the book of James and the Old Testament book of Proverbs. There's lots of wisdom he will get in your business, he will tell you what you should and shouldn't be doing, and give you direction whether you want it or not. And I know that sounds like something that is... Um, depressing because you don't want to be told what to do if you're like anything like me, but it's also great, great insight, great, great wisdom that we will learn from throughout the second half of this road trip series. So we're going to start chapter one, verse one. If you have your Bibles, please open them and follow along with us. Chapter one, verse one says this, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. Greetings. Now, when he talks about the 12 tribes, this is the diaspora. These are the tribes of Israel, the Jewish people that have been scattered amongst the Gentiles, and they're living in various places across um, the nations, across these areas. So he's writing to them in pure, like different places, wherever they are. And he says, greetings. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of any kind, of many kinds, This, and what James is talking about, and what he will continue to talk about for a moment, is patience. How often do you face really simple, small things and get completely frustrated and let you ruin your day, and possibly even the day of those around you? I know for me, uh, when I was thinking about this and thinking about the trials that I might face on a daily basis, I went immediately to really simple things that should not impact my day at all, which is like, you know, getting my kids to put on pants so we can go to school, things like that. They just completely frustrate and ruin our mornings. The weather, it being too hot so that we walk from our house to our car and we start sweating immediately because we're frustrated that we live in Florida and it's 95 degrees. Those small things, he says of many kinds, those are tiny, tiny instances. But think about the audience with which James or to which James is writing He's writing to people who have been completely displaced from their homes. They've been taken away from their homeland. They don't have houses. They don't have jobs. Completely uprooted from their world. And he says, consider it pure joy. Consider it pure joy. Why? Verse 3. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. I think we often ask God for wisdom Um, And throughout the day, I'm going to say we and just assume that you have the same problems that I do, but I'm primarily talking about myself when I say these things, not you guys. But we often uh, ask God for wisdom and how to deal with certain situations. Yet, often when we hear the answer to these questions, we still want to control the outcome. We may say things like, God, why am I having such a hard time in this relationship? Why, God, why am I struggling with this particular sin? And so often we ask ourselves these questions, yet when God speaks to us, we rationalize, we make excuses, and we seek a second opinion from someone else. Why do we do that? Because deep down, deep down, we know that God is saying things like, you don't need to be in this relationship. You're having trust issues because your own actions aren't trustworthy. You can't hear me clearly or grow closer to me because you won't let go of this addiction or this habit. And it's easy to doubt the difficult word we hear. 
is not of God, or I'm sorry, it's easy to doubt that the difficult word that we hear is not of God, is of God when it doesn't align with our visions of the future. When it requires us to take a difficult step in our faith. When it means we have to stop doing something that we enjoy. When we have to stop a particular habit so that we can follow him more closely. We don't like that. Again, not you guys, I'm talking about me. And we're left with a difficult truth. Don't ask God a question if you don't wanna know the answer. Don't ask God a question if you don't wanna know the answer. Verse six, but when you ask, you must believe and not um, doubt because the one who doubts is like the wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all that they do. If you're going to be sure of yourself in anything, be sure of yourself and your identity in the Lord. Verse nine, believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high positions. And this seems contrary, it seems counterintuitive because it says things, the humble circumstances take pride in your high position. But again, we're not talking about society. We're not talking about the world. We're talking about the kingdom of God. And in this moment, James is telling us that remember in your humble circumstances, you should be excited by the position in which you are in. Matthew 23, 12 says this, for those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. So often in our culture, however, we look at humility and humbleness as a sign of weakness. Yet, as Pastor Emmanuel talked about last week and as he introed in a way the book of James, humility and humbleness is how we're able to hear God's voice and follow it. Why is that? Because if we are so egocentric and prideful, our own voices will fill the space between our ears. And there's no room in those moments for God to speak. Verse 10, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation since they will pass away like a wildflower for the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. And in the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. The New Living Translation uh, says it this way, and those who are rich should boast that God has humbled them. How often do you see someone who's at the top of a business be humbled and take pride in that? Not very often. Why? Because the world tells us that we failed, that we've fallen from glory, that we no longer have grace in our lives because we were once in a power, we were once in authority, and now we are humbled. Yet the book of James tells us the rich should take pride in this. They should take pride in this. In the same way, Again, New Living Translation towards the end of this verse says, in the same way the rich will fade away with their achievements. The things of this world will not last forever. Your relationship with money, your relationship with your house, the way in which you drive a nice car, those things are very, very temporary in the grand scheme of things, in the scope of the universe. What will last forever is your relationship with the Father. So when God shows you that money and possessions are not the most important things in this life, I say rejoice. Rejoice. Even if you're in a difficult financial spot, even if it means you're having issues in your relationships, even if you're struggling in your job or you don't have one, rejoice. Because the sooner we realize that the things of this world will fade away, the sooner we realize the importance of having a real relationship with our Heavenly Father, the old saying is true, you can't take it with you, but you can have an eternal relationship with God. Verse 12, blessed is the one who perseveres in the trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. There will be things in your life that you simply cannot handle alone. This is the importance of humility. If we try to deal with these things that are larger, we will fail miserably. Why? Because we think we can handle it and we think we have all the answers. When in reality, our answers are fueled by pride and ego. 
not from the Father. Verse 13, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they're dragged away by their own evil desires and enticed. We have limits. This is why we need to face our limitations, our temptations, our struggles, head on with the Lord, honestly and humbly. But we must deal with them. We cannot ignore them. Because unhandled desires, undealt with temptations, lead to decisions that are made in the flesh and death, not the life found in Jesus. We can't let these things go unchecked in our lives because we're the ones who will then try to handle them versus trusting and relying on the Lord in these difficult moments. Verse 15. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death, which is what we just talked about. Verse 16, don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. God is steadfast. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we may be a kind of first fruits of all that he created. Verse 19, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. If you've heard a verse from James, it's probably this one. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. This makes me think about our Father's Day panel a few weeks ago. If anybody was here for our Father's Day panel, we were lucky enough to be joined by a couple of dads in the church, uh, Casey and uh, William Peterson, and they were incredible and gave some great insights about what it means to have um, kids and to lead those kids into a life following Jesus, to be humbly submitted to the Father in your parenting. And during that conversation, Um, I think it was William, he said something like this. By God's design, we have two ears and one mouth. I just try to use them accordingly. How different would our lives look if we actually followed that advice? God gave us two ears and one mouth, and we try to use them accordingly. Quick to listen, slow to speak. And I like to think that if we are slow to speak, then we will become uh, slow to become angry. But how often when you're in a disagreement with someone, or when we're in a disagreement with someone, we're only listening just enough so that we can respond. And we listen to the first few sentences of that person's argument and what they're going to say, and immediately our brains start thinking, what am I going to say? How am I going to respond to this? How am I going to prove my point? I have to get my point across. This person has to understand me and where I'm coming from. Why do we think that? Because we think we're right and we think we have all the answers. Yet, yet, we see this application in daily life. If we were to take a breath and allow the Holy Spirit to speak into our interactions, Less of us would be present in that conversation and more of God would be. And more of what God wants to speak in those people's lives versus what I want to speak in someone's life or I think is important. When we stop and take a breath and we allow the Holy Spirit to speak through us, we allow the Holy Spirit to speak through us, the words that would have been biting and resentful, condescending, passive aggressive, straight up aggressive, now become calm and encouraging and full of life. Our thoughts and our words can be completely transformed by the Holy Spirit. Again, though, here James is emphasizing humility and patience, and the importance for us to realize that we don't have to have all the answers. We have to take a breath, and we have to allow the Holy Spirit to speak through us. We have to be slow to speak and quick to listen. 
Verse 21 says, therefore, get rid of all moral filth and evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. In other words, get rid of the ways of the world, embrace the kingdom, accept and surrender to the word. And when we do this sincerely, we'll see that not only will our thoughts change, but our actions will shift as well, because it is impossible, it's impossible to stay the same if we truly allow God to come into our lives and transform our hearts. It's impossible. Our thoughts influence our actions. What comes in goes out. And James continues in verse 22. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. Over the past year, we've been talking a lot about be before do. Hear that middle word clearly, before do. It doesn't say be not do. Be before do. Be in the presence of God so that the things that you are doing are of God. They're from God. And this is hard. This is hard. Because it means things like if you struggle with lustful thoughts, then you should change the way that you engage with social media and the internet in general. If you struggle with gossip, meaning you do it, not that you're not good at it. If you struggle with gossip, maybe you should quit consuming reality TV and things that glorify drama. If you have a tough time trusting or loving people because of traumatic experiences, then maybe you should go to counseling. You should seek help. You should find guidance. We come and we listen to God's word and you're here today or you're joining us on our online campus and you're listening to the ways in which we're supposed to love people. But if we don't go out and do it, it's incomplete. It's incomplete. Verse 23 says, anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. I think about this and the idea of being made in the image of God and seeing yourself as being made in the image of God. And if we see ourselves being made in the image of God, if that is our true identity, it's really difficult to follow the ways of the world because you see yourself differently. You don't see yourself of the world. You cannot turn away from the mirror and forget that you are made in the image of God. Verse 25, but whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. And that, again, also seems contrary, the idea that a law can give you freedom. But if you want life, you follow God's perfect laws. If you don't, if you think that that is restrictive, follow the ways of the world and see how free you really are. Because the ways of the world bring bondage. They bring pain, they bring heartache, they bring frustrations. God's perfect law brings freedom because you don't have those things in your life. Or if you do, you know how to deal with them. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Verse 26, those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. This is just a little preview of what's to come in chapter three um, in the book of James where there will be discussion about the power of words. But if you consider yourself this way, yet act in a completely different manner, then your religion is worthless. 
Religion that God our Father accepts. And I love the way 26 and 27 are juxtaposed with each other because it says, your religion is worthless if you do this way, but really if you're going to follow the religion of God, if you're going to be a follower of Christ, if you're going to live a life honoring him, verse 27 shows you how to do it. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows. And here we see a representation in both this culture that James is writing to, but also in our current culture. It's a representation for the completely powerless in our society. As followers of Jesus, we're meant to look after the powerless and to be with them and sit with them in moments of pain, not serve as their oppressors. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphan and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. And that thought, that idea, being polluted by the world, it kind of leads some Christian circles to say, well, then we should keep to ourselves. We should stay secluded. We should be in our Christian bubble because we don't want the world to come in and destroy our perfectness and our holiness It's not what this is. If you keep it to yourself, how can you possibly share the good news of Jesus with others who haven't experienced it? You are to go into the world and you are to impact it, not let it impact you. Which is why it is ever so important to be humble in your faith and to be constantly reminding yourself where your strength comes from, and the image that you are created in. That image is of God, not of the outside world. And when we have that and we walk into the world, the world becomes a much less scary place. And that's the first chapter of James. Uh, And we're going to do that sort of, I'm not, but some people are going to do that every week and kind of walk through this whole book. And it's going to be a great, great, great exploration of what it means to live a Christian life, but it's challenging. James opens this book with some really challenging ideas. He opens his letter with some really difficult statements. Find joy during trials. Complete transparency here. I don't like to find joy during trials. Um, To be honest, it is mentally exhausting when things are difficult. And it's easy to feel beaten down. Sometimes I don't handle adversity smoothly. And I get easily frustrated in moments when things don't go my way. And I allow frustration and anger to creep into my life. And if I'm being very real with you, I cling to it from time to time. Because it's easier. It's easier to be frustrated and to be angry, whether it's a big thing or a small thing, if you have someone else to blame for the reason why you're being a jerk. It just is. And that could be a spouse, that could be a friend, that could be a coworker, that could be your neighbor. Any of those people in your life. Sometimes we like to cling to the anger. Sometimes we like to stay frustrated because it gives us an excuse. We can blame someone else for our poor behavior. Because in those moments, you get to control the narrative. You get to say, I'm frustrated and I have a reason and I'm going to continue to hold on to this thing and I'm going to not act like the loving and forgiving person that I'm supposed to be. But it's hard to be kind when the kindness isn't reciprocated. That is why it's so important to have the humility to realize that sometimes you cannot do these things on your own. The hanging on, the frustration and anger. And again, that's just me. I know you guys don't do that. Um, 
it requires um, us to have humility and to recognize that that comes from pride and an unwillingness to admit that we need to change the way we think about something. You want some humility in your life? Find yourself a spouse. And you all giggle and you all laugh because you know exactly what I'm talking about. But I don't mean it in the nagging wife way. So before we get started, let's just on the record state that I don't mean that my wife is a nagging wife. Um, But find yourself a spouse. Because what happens in those moments is when you're hanging on to the anger and you're hanging on to the frustration and you're being a jerk to those around you and you're being difficult to live with, if you have someone in your life who will hold you accountable, who will challenge you, together the two of you can grow in your relationship with Jesus. And it's a really beautiful thing. You may say, but I'm not married. That's okay. Find yourself a friend that you can trust that's gonna call you out when you're acting this way. Find yourself someone that you know is going to be completely honest with you in those really difficult moments. And can we be bold for just a moment? If you have your Bibles with you, I would love for you in this moment, or if you don't wanna write in your Bible, that's fine too. Um, If you wanna write on your notes, if you wanna make a mental note, if you wanna put a note in your phone, let's be bold for a moment and let's write down the person that you're thinking of right now. If you don't have anybody in mind, someone that can hold you accountable, over the next week, I want you to think about that. I want you to think about the person who you can trust to call you out when you're living life out of frustration and anger and bitterness because you're unwilling to surrender those things to the Lord. Thinking about um, this after you write the name down, now do something about it. Call the person. Have a conversation with them tonight at your house. Get coffee, grab lunch, and say, hey, I really struggle with this particular thing. I'm not being humble in my faith, and I want you to push me. I want you to challenge me. I want us to grow together. How can we do that? And start that relationship, but it's hard, and it takes courage to step out in faith like that. When I recognize or someone else recognizes these things impacting my behaviors and the way I treat others, and I'm willing to try to change my feelings, deep down, I realize that I need to spend more time in the presence of God, personally. When I'm in these moments where I'm allowing anger and frustration to creep in and control my emotions and control my life, I realize in those moments that I need to spend time in the presence of God. That is the first step of seeking reconciliation and redemption and rebuilding of relationships is spending time in the presence of God that will then inform that and guide you and allow the Holy Spirit to do a work on your heart and in your life. And I also need you to realize and recognize that this isn't a one and done type of situation. This is not a, I grabbed coffee, now I'm good. It requires you to check back in. It requires you to self-evaluate. It requires you to say, why am I being such a jerk in this moment? Why am I not letting this go? Why am I hanging on to this? And the honest assessment of where you are and your humility and willingness to reach out to that person and say, help me with this, help me process this. You want a great accountability partner? Find somebody like James. I think he would drive me crazy as an accountability partner. But anyway, find somebody like James who's gonna speak hard truths into your life. And I'll be honest with you, um, as I close, I kind of wanna just share that I spent so many years running away from this, so many years trying to do things on my own. Even after knowing Jesus, I ran from him. And I wanted to do it by myself and I wanted to do things my way. And I wanted to live a life my way. I didn't wanna follow his perfect law because I wanted freedom. I wanted freedom. I wanted to make my own choices, make my own decisions. But guess what that freedom brought me? Pain and heartache until one day I said, fine God, have it your way. I re-surrendered my life to what he wanted from me versus what I wanted from me. 
And he saved me. He saved me. And I don't mean this from a way of like salvation because I was already saved. I was already baptized when I was a kid. Like, but when I really let him have control, he saved me from myself. He saved me from the world. And he pointed me to the truth in his life. And he made me look in a mirror and he made me have an honest reflection and made me realize that I'm created in his image, not in something of the world. And now is my responsibility to spend time in his presence and to grow and find joy in the middle of the trials. The perseverance of our faith comes from this is all about having and developing patience. Luckily, we don't have to do this alone. As we grow in our understanding of God and our relationship with Him, we're able to allow the Holy Spirit to come in and do transformative work that then produces those fruits, that then produces patience, emotional health, and spiritual maturity. Allow God to speak to you through this book. Allow him to work on your heart. Approach him with humility and humbleness and a lack of pride that helps us realize that we can't do it on our own. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the faithful who wrote it. Help us to live lives constantly trying to surrender to you more and more every day, realizing that we cannot do this on our own, that your plan is much better than our plan could ever be, and that a surrendering is anything but restrictions and bondage, that your law is perfect and it brings freedom and joy and life that the world wants to fill with death and pain. We love you. Amen.